On Dr. Peter Atia's recent podcast, episode 194, he interviewed Dr. Richard Johnson, who gave an incredibly comprehensive overview of his whole hypothesis about how fructose drives metabolic disease. Unfortunately, this podcast, over two hours long, can be pretty hard to understand for the casual listener. So my goal is to simplify the content that Dr. Richard Johnson presented in this podcast and shorten it in an easy to understand way. Dr. Johnson's hypothesis and his research over the past decades is that fructose is the prime cause of most metabolic disease we see in Western society, type two diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and high blood pressure. That doesn't mean it's the only cause or that there aren't other contributing factors, but he's pretty much got me convinced that he's mostly right here. And if you wait till the end, I'll explain how Dr. Johnson's fructose-driven obesity model still fits with the second law of thermodynamics and calories in always equals calories out. First, we need to clarify some terminology. Sugar, table sugar, the white crystals that you bake with is sucrose. But sucrose is actually a compound molecule made up of a molecule of glucose bound with a molecule of fructose. Confusingly, glucose and fructose are also sugars chemically. But in common language, when people say sugar, they mean sucrose. Dr. Johnson's whole hypothesis and all of his research focuses on fructose. Fructose is different from glucose, another simple sugar, which is actually much more common. Glucose is the sugar molecule that makes up starch, is present in nearly all of the carbohydrates that we eat, and is used by all the cells in our body to make energy. Fructose, on the other hand, isn't typically directly added to any of the foods we eat. It is present in fruits and in high fructose corn syrup, but the most common source of it is in the sucrose we eat, the sugar that you add to a cake when you bake it, the sugar that's in chocolate and candy. We get lots of fructose, but we don't get it in a standalone form. We get it as a part of the sucrose molecule that it makes up. But as soon as it gets in your body, our body very quickly breaks it down into the separate glucose and fructose molecule. That's why it's important to talk about how fructose is metabolized in the body. One other important point to get across before we get into the podcast is the various sources of sugar in our diet. We already talked about table sugar, which is 100% sucrose. If you could zoom in with a microscope, Every single molecule of sucrose is actually a molecule of glucose bound to a molecule of fructose. So it's basically 50-50 fructose and glucose. High fructose corn syrup is primarily simple sugars, but it's mostly glucose and fructose in an almost 50-50 mixture. Fructose is a little bit higher, like 55% in most high fructose corn syrup, but still effectively the amount of fructose you're getting in high fructose corn syrup is very similar to the amount of fructose you get in sugar. Likewise, honey, or at least the sugar part of honey, is about 50-50 fructose and glucose. Same with maple syrup. In table sugar, the glucose and fructose are bound together. In high fructose corn syrup, these are all independent monosaccharides floating around. But when you zoom out, each of these has approximately the same ratio of fructose to total sugar. We have a simple diagram of a cell here. When fructose comes into the cell, like all other sources of energy, it's gonna go through a complex pathway of chemical reactions that ultimately are used to make energy. We're metabolizing this food to make energy to power our bodies. That energy you've probably heard of is called ATP. It's the most common source of energy to run all of the necessary functions of our body. I like to symbolize ATP as a charged battery. We've got a full charge here. And when fructose comes through this, these metabolic pathways to create energy, the energy is created by charging up ADP. So you can think of ADP as discharged or partially discharged batteries. And by metabolizing our food, we charge it up to make ATP. But, and this is a big part of what Dr. Johnson's hypothesis hinges on, is the first step to breaking down fructose or other sugars actually consumes energy, consumes ATP. So the ATP releases some of its charge, which is a phosphate group, and that phosphate group phosphorylates fructose, and we're left with ADP, adenosine diphosphate, which is like a discharged battery. And this phosphorylated fructose is what goes through the pathway, which ultimately makes much more ATP. But this first step consumes energy, consumes ATP, which leaves behind a discharged battery, ADP. I've drawn them this way because ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. So there's three phosphate groups here. The first one that's removed is the most common source of energy and it's removed ATP changes to ADP, adenosine diphosphate. There's only two phosphate groups left. But the unique thing about fructose me metabolism, this energy degradation pathway, is that this is kind of a runaway reaction. As fructose comes into the cell, it consumes ATP to begin this reaction 
and more fructose comes into the cell, we consume more ATP, and this runaway reaction just consumes all of the ATP in the cell. How this is done, this is all mediated through an enzyme called fructokinase. ATP doesn't simply release its phosphate group to fructose. It's all done through an enzyme which basically facilitates this reaction. And fructokinase has no breaks on it. So basically fructose will keep flooding into the cell and will keep consuming ATP, building up a whole bunch of discharge batteries. This is different from glucose metabolism. And remember, glucose is the predominant energy source for all of our cells. So what I'm showing here is how most of the energy is made for our body. For glucose, and glucokinase or hexakinase, there's a brake pedal. As soon as the cell starts to build up ADP, discharge batteries, it acts like a brake on glucokinase. So this reaction doesn't just continue running away. Once we've gotten a little bit of glucose started down this pathway, phosphorylating it, using up some ATP, the whole thing slows down. The cell puts on the brake and says, whoa, 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 let's finish processing this glucose before we process mo more, before we consume all of the ATP in, in the cell. So back to fructose, not only can this reaction tend to run away and deplete all the energy in the cell, there's another mechanism that builds on this, and that's that the ADP can be further consumed down to AMP, adenosine monophosphate, so I've drawn that with only a single phosphate, which ultimately can be converted to what's thought of as a waste product, uric acid. So not only are we consuming all the full batteries, we're getting rid of the discharge batteries, which ideally we would recharge later to make more energy. Dr. Johnson and Dr. Atia then spend a lot of the podcast talking about this uric acid not only being a waste product, but being a signaling molecule that tells the cell, that tells the body to store fat, create fat. So not only does the runaway consumption of ATP to metabolize the fructose cause a state of fake starvation. The cell thinks it's starving. But additionally, the uric acid and many of the other molecules in the fructose metabolism all signal to the body, puts it in a fat storage state. All these signals say, you're hungry, eat more, store fat, lower your resting metabolism. Some of these things work by the uric acid promoting oxidative stress on the mitochondria, reducing their ability to make ATP. There's leptin resistance, which make your body always feel like it's hungry, even when you've eaten a lot of food. And even worse, the more your body is used to sugar, the more your body will tend down this pathway. Dr. Johnson says that if you're used to sugar, if you're primed to having a lot of fructose, your body will overexpress the molecules that are required to get fructose into the liver cells in the first place and overexpress fructokinase, the enzyme that consumes ATP to start metabolizing fructose. Dr. Johnson wrote a book on this in 2008, but since then he's realized it's not just the fructose you eat, it's the fructose you make. So completely avoiding all sugar and all fructose in your diet doesn't keep all fructose out of your body. Our bodies can actually make fructose out of glucose. So what I've done here is drawn a blood vessel on the left side of the screen and shown all the glucose molecules. When you hear people talking about blood sugar, they're talking about blood glucose confusingly. So this is a case where we're using the word sugar to mean glucose, not sucrose. That's why I like to use the word blood glucose to be clear what we're talking about. Anytime you eat any refined carbs with starches in them, even if there's no sugar, no fructose, all of that glucose gets into your bloodstream. What Dr. Johnson and others have shown is that there's a not insignificant conversion of glucose into fructose in the body. You call this endogenous fructogenesis. And for, very, for normal healthy people, very little of this may occur. But for diabetics that have high blood glucose, up to a third of their blood glucose can be converted into fructose via this polyol pathway. So Dr. Atia and Dr. Johnson spend some time talking about this. Basically, the glucose is first converted to sorbitol by aldose reductase, which is then converted into fructose. So especially in people that already have the signs of metabolic syndrome, people that are overweight, have type 2 diabetes, high blood sugar, this fructogenesis can still contribute to this feeling of starvation that your cells have, even if you're not eating any fructose. If you're just eating lots of high glycemic index foods, starchy foods fo starchy foods with carbs that have a lot of glucose. Interestingly, although this polyol pathway, the, the endogenous creation of fructose, is turned on by high blood glucose levels, it's not necessarily the high glucose in the bloodstream that turns it on. It's high amounts of anything, high osmolality of your blood. So if there's lots of anything dissolved in your blood, 
it will turn on this pathway converting glucose to fructose, which then starts the energy depletion cascade in your liver cells. So another common culprit is salt. Dr. Johnson has shown that dehydration, high salt content of your blood, can also turn on this pathway, creating fructose out of the starch you eat. Another fascinating little tidbit that Dr. Johnson dropped is that when women go through menopause, their estrogen levels drop significantly. Before menopause, when they have high estrogen, that estrogen inhibits uric acid. After menopause, their estrogen levels drop, which allows uric acid to accumulate, which again is this signaling molecule which tells the body to store fat. That's just one little example of the many things that Dr. Johnson's hypothesis explains in my mind. Other ones include, why is it harder to stay lean when we get older? Why do athletes seem like they can eat anything they want? Why are most traditional calorie restriction diets so hard to maintain? Why have keto and low carb and paleo diets have so much success? Hint, they don't have very much fructose in them. But all along, both Dr. Johnson and Peter Atiyah both fully subscribe to the fact that calories in have to equal calories out. None of this disobeys the second law of thermodynamics. And I'll show you how. In the traditional model, where people get fat simply because they eat too much and exercise too little, it looks like this. We have a caloric surplus when we take in more calories of food than we burn in energy, both via exercise and our resting metabolism. So I've shown this here with five units worth of calories in and only four units worth of calories out. That extra calorie has to go somewhere and ultimately that extra calorie will be stored as fat. Five units of energy in has to equal five units of energy out or in this case, four units of energy out plus one unit of energy stored. In a caloric deficit, we're only eating four units of energy but we're using five units of energy. That extra unit of energy has to come from somewhere so you burn off fat and lose weight. This is obvious, but if calories in have to equal calories out, how can calories of fructose make people build so much fat? In Dr. Johnson's model of fructose-driven obesity, let's start with a person who has four units of energy in and four units of energy out. But a lot of this energy in comes in the form of sugar. That's gonna immediately drive the body through that energy depletion pathway and all the signaling to store fat. Your body goes into a high alert state and says, we gotta convert all these calories into fat. We gotta stop burning fat. Let's pack away this energy for later. Now that energy has to come from somewhere. So then this individual is driven to eat more by leptin resistance, by high ghrelin. So it's very difficult to stay at this level of food intake they have. So I'm gonna display that by this person now going and getting more food, an additional unit of intake. On top of that, the body's auto-regulation starts ramping down your resting metabolism. People will feel lethargic. They may not have the energy to exercise. So I've represented this by taking away another unit of energy used. So five still equals five. We still have five units of energy in and five units of energy out and stored. But the causality is different here. The fructose drives the body to store fat and then the balance is maintained by the individual eating more and burning less. I highly recommend Dr. Johnson's book. As soon as I finished Peter Atiyah's podcast with him, I went out and bought Dr. Johnson's brand new book, Nature Wants Us to Be Fat. It's actually easier to understand than his podcast. It's much more written for the layperson and has lots of other supporting information and evidence for his hypothesis about fructose. It also includes recommended diets for how to lose weight if you're already obese, how to maintain your lean weight if you're healthy, what to eat and what to avoid.